I will never stop beating the drum for Columbia basketball. Coach Megan Griffith is here to talk all about what the Lions are going to do for an encore after an epic season. Locked on women's basketball starts now. Ogumba Wallet for the win. You are locked on women's basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Well, hi, everyone, and happy Thursday to you. Happy almost college basketball season just a few days away. I am Howard Magdal, and I want to thank you for making us your first listen every day. Over 160,000 of you, our all-time record turned up in October alone to listen. You show up for us the way we show up for you six days a week. Make sure you subscribe, rate, and review. I just recently found out reviewing is a thing. Tell people about us uh, wherever you get your podcasts. And of course, it is not just me. It is the incredible team over at the next at the next hoops.com where we have over a hundred reported pieces every single month the incredible jen hatfield i know you say oh she does mystics oh she does sibling coverage well she's also the best ivy league reporter you're ever going to see she has an ivy league preview up make sure you read her and everyone else and subscribe if you can nine dollars a month seventy two dollars a year to cover the world of women's basketball and my goodness if there was a more enjoyable story in 2023 in women's basketball than Columbia. I, I'd like to know about it. I'm just going to throw a number out there because uh, what, what Megan Griffith has done at Columbia, listeners, you must understand the five years before she got here, the five years before she got here, the team had a total of 33 wins. Last year alone, 28 wins 28 and six a fantastic offense a fantastic defense as well that doesn't get talked about enough coach when you think about what this season was and we'll get into it there's some disappointment obviously about frustrations near the end i still feel it i'm not even affiliated with the program i'm just i'm not doug feinberg i just as an <laughs> i was upset on a question of basic fairness but like have, did you let that sink in over the course of this past summer that even at the high standard you'd set, that last year was was something else. Yeah, well, hi, Howard. It's so great to be here, and I enjoy talking hoops with you. It was, it, yes, it sunk in. It did. I, I think it's still, it hits me. Uh, just going through now the second cycle, you know, or the next cycle of a season, you know, you're like, oh, like these these markers and the things that I remember from last year, I think are really, you know, like, oh, wow, we did this or this happened at this point in time. But I don't know if it'll fully hit me for a while. I think it'll be one of those, like, when I'm really sitting back thinking about taking it all in. Um, it, honestly, we had a Hall of Fame event this fall, and that hit me more. It hit me more there than it did, like, over the course of the summer, I think, just because of the th – I'm like, I could see our team being there in 10 years, right? So that was – I think it's just small moments like that that help remind me of how special it was. I mean, it's a team for the ages. There's no question about it. It was a team that fell a little bit short in the committee's eyes of making the NCAA tournament. I bring it up. You know, we talked just after, and you still weren't over it then, and it still blew my mind. And I will, I, I will, I will think about these things for years and years on end because you have each team is new. You have a lot of returners, but each team is new, and it's sort of a moment in time and a chance to get that. We'll talk about the schedule that you have here because it feels on reading it like, okay, well, you're really leaving nothing to chance, but how do you get over a thing like that? How did you <laughs> get over it? How did you get over it? Or if you have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was honestly, it took us about a week, like from the moment of selection Sunday to playing our first round game against uh, FDU and the WNIT. I think we all like grieved that, you know, loss for our program in very different ways. And, you know, I, I give a huge credit to my staff because if, if they weren't the people who they were, I don't know if I would have been able to get past it as quickly or my, my team, my pro the program in general. And for us to set, set on a path that was, you know, heartbreak, but Hey, let's reframe a new opportunity 
uh, I, I was just I'm immensely proud of everybody that was involved to, to be able to flip that switch pretty quickly. But it took us a hard week uh, to get through that and and really come out on the other side and try to make some history and do something really special on the other side. Which you did. And for listeners who may not remember, you know, a lot of times those teams that don't make the NCAA tournament, you see it reflected in the NIT. You did not see that from Columbia, a run all the way to the championship game to face Kansas. Uh, I got to see the win over Syracuse at home firsthand. Just, you know, a team that is built for the postseason. I'm very interested, obviously, to see what that looks like. But again, you, you were proactive on the court and proactive off the court. And so I want to talk a little bit about this schedule coming up and you open on uh monday against stony brook at stony brook not an easy way to start and <laughs> from there just to give people a sense of it seton hall duke towson georgia and florida northeastern back home providence much improved this year villanova memphis you've got wagner and then you go out west san francisco you play pacific before you start the Ivy League schedule with, you know, just a real easy one against Penn, right? I mean, it, obviously you have this scenario where you're running the gamut. Two things. Is this team built to do it? Is that part of why you did it? Because there's so much experience on this team. And the other is, do you believe that this addresses whatever was missing in RPI or whatever was led to that decision last March. Is that playing a part in your in your thinking here? Well, to answer the first question in terms of being built for it, uh, I absolutely believe that with the leadership of, of Abby Shu and Kitty Henderson, and then some of our really key components that even if they didn't have large roles last year, you know, the Paige Lauders, Noah Komasanya, who did not play last year, Perry Page, who was a valuable six, six woman until she went down with a knee injury, Nicole Stevens, another valuable six woman, before she had an ankle injury that ended her season. We've had some really pivotal high thinkers of the game um, return to us this season. And, you know, again, like I said, starting with Abby and Kitty, uh, who, you know, were on the floor big minutes uh, in that season, they are absolutely 100% all the things right about Columbia women's basketball. So I know that with them, it's just a matter of time for us to kind of figure out how this team is going to evolve. What's this team's identity going to be? not trying to be and chase the things of last year. We have eight new faces and I can tell you that they've fit in so well. You know, there's obviously learning curves and adjustments, but some people have stepped up right away. Some people, you know, are taking longer than others, but that's just part of the process. And we're just trying to be patient as a staff and as a program. And our floor leaders have done a really nice job fitting them seamlessly into the program and the culture here. Uh, and then in terms of the schedule in you know, why, why we scheduled I, kind of what you said. I didn't want to leave anything on the table. I didn't want anything to be left up to chance for us come March and even going into January. Are we ready? Right. I've had schedules in the past where you, you open up with Penn or you open up even at Cornell or whomever, right. Our league is tough. Our league is smart. People scout at a really high level and you, you don't get anything easy when it comes to conference play. And so for me, last year's schedule absolutely prepared us the right way. And I, I really believe in that and, and the formula we used last year to replicate this year. I mean, it is frustrating at some level. I know you share this frustration, the idea, and we're talking non-conference and that obviously matters for everyone. But the idea is, well, the non-conference is all that matters for an Ivy League team. The idea that yeah. you can't consider an Ivy League win a big win. And to be honest with you, it feels similar to me to the trajectory we saw from the Pac-12 about a decade ago. When you saw the Pac-12 as a lead level up and you were extending beyond just Stanford and on occasion UCLA to fully mm -hmm. understand, wow, running through that lead is not an easy thing mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. And making sure that people understand that a win over Princeton is a big deal. A win over Harvard is a big deal. A win over Penn is a big deal. And so I am hopeful that there's greater attention paid to that. Um, we will see. Uh, I certainly mm -hmm. intend to continue banging the drum on it. I do, though, want to get into this incredible team of players. We're going to talk about them in segment two, starting with Abby, who everybody, everybody listening here needs to see in person. <laughs> but first... Yeah. We're going to talk about our friends over at Prize Picks. 
Prize Picks, one of the sponsors of today's show. And you might wonder what it is. Prize Picks is the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. Uh, they give you an opportunity to play essentially against yourself, right? So NBA, for instance, you have the opportunity to pick between two and six players, and you are going up against the projection from prize picks. Not somebody else, not somebody who has, you know, sort of a, a, a crazy run of luck, but you go against yourself. If you have a player who exits the game in the first half, too, and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks even protects you against that. It's the only daily fantasy sports platform with essentially an injury insurance policy. So if you want to learn more, go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA and use code locked on NBA for a first deposit match of up to a hundred dollars. Again, that is code L O C K E D O N N B A. Prizepicks.com, the place to play daily fantasy sports. So I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to say Abby Shu is two three pointers shy of the all time Ivy League mark. I think she's going to reach that and in fact pass it this year. What do you think? <laughs> I, I, I think so too, Howard. I do. <laughs> so we have agreement on that. We have to just talk about what she does and you know, people talk about things like, you know, the Taj Mahal and the Grand Canyon. But for me, like, I go to Abby's shot chart. And when I want to see, like, the true beauty in the world, to see the way in which she, her efficiency is off the charts. And when you have somebody who's so good about that, who's so good about, you know, she's dangerous at the mid range, but she's so good from beyond the arc, she gets to the rim. What do you do as a coach? to find, to push her to that next level when it's already such a high standard? Mm -hmm. Well, you just get her to hone in more on the details, right? Um, everybody, like no matter how good you are or wherever you are in your career, there's a, there's somewhere, there's something else to learn. There's, there's a new skill set to add to your tool bag, right? There's, there's a lot of that. There's a lot out there for you to, to increase your knowledge about. So I, we, I just challenge Abby to continue to be a student of the game and to, to hone in again and being a more efficient player uh, in mm -hmm. all ways. And, and I think for her, sometimes just taking the focus off of her shot helps her dramatically, right? Being a shooter is like a blessing and a curse, right? Because you have such an elite skill set. And for somebody that shoots it like she does, but also it's your perfectionist, right? When that's your thing. And so we try to to focus a lot more, not just on, you know, her shot, but the other ways that she can impact the game, which I think in in turn helps her shot and helps her confidence. She does a little bit of everything for you. You know, I mean, you, you look at her numbers and it does extend beyond even that shooting. She was over four rebounds per game. You know, her assist percentage up over 14 last year. She doesn't turn the ball over despite getting so much attention on her from opposing defenses. I just I wonder how much you think the spacing you get. And just, you know, to give people a sense, this team was 50th in pace, and so sometimes that obscures offensive efficiency. It doesn't with you guys. You guys were sixth in the nation in assisted shot percentage. Does that, is that kind of when you think of it, the tip of the spear, when you think about the way in which everyone else comes in based on the fact that there are defenses that have to pay so much attention to her? And does that give her the opportunity, like you said, to create in other ways too, even more this year? Definitely. I, you know, she, I think we always think about like who's the star player on your team, right? Or like when you're scouting, who's the kid that you really got a game plan around? And every night she's that kid for another team. And so when you like look at it that way, you know, we, we just try to make sure that she she touches the ball enough, right? I think that's a big part of it. But also she understands like there's so many ways that she can exploit a coverage and for our team to really understand that, but continue to be who we are because we put so much pressure on you on the glass and because we're going to defend and we're collectively, we have great length. You know, it, it's going to put people in in funny spots on the floor where like they're going to have to cross match with her if they really want to match up every game, and that's that puts people in tons of pressure in transition, right? Because we're so good in transition. So, I feel like you know, for us, we try to stick true to our identity and just help our team understand how to play with such a great player like her, a great scorer like her, but also like the best way to have her score is for us all to score, right? If we can accumulate at every position around 15 points. Now we're averaging 75 
to 80, which is where we want to target as a program. Um, and, and that's honestly the bigger goal is when we're teaching to help everybody understand why it's important to have all five players as a threat. She's got this jab step. I'm just, you know, it's a kind of close <laughs> that, you know, when I look and I talk to, and there are WNBA talent evaluators who see her and understand what she can be yep. at the next level. But that's one of those separators, right? That's one of those interviews you say, all right, so it doesn't matter who's defending her at the next level. She's going to be able to get her shot mm -hmm. off as well. But there is a balance there. And I just wonder how you navigate it. You know, she's obviously very effective from the mid range. You guys are uh, practically religious about the way in which you are looking for the highest percentage shot. So just to give people a sense of it, you know, Abby, about 18% of her attempts were mid range, right? You guys for as a team, including Abby, were just over 11, which is crazy low. It's one of the best numbers. And I'll say yeah. best because again, you're talking about where's your best shot in the country. So do you balance those two things where you're thinking about not only what Abby can do for you, here, but what Abby can be at the next level with like what it is to maximize to get that kind of perfect level of efficiency you're trying to reach? Absolutely. I, you know, I've been talking with Abby about her next step after college for the last couple of years, especially once the pandemic hit, it was, we could focus on basketball a lot, right? She took that year off from school. She was working, but it, she really got to hone in, in her craft. And ever since then, she's been, you know, with the USA basketball experience this past summer and being picked as one of the best players in the country amongst 11 other peers. I think she's starting to understand like where her future is with this game. And that's like, that can be daunting and, and big and scary when you're young, but now, you know, she's, she's, she's grown and, you know, she's been in a college system for four years. And I think she knows that her game needs to continue to grow this way. Right. And, um, and she's put the time in to do it as well, but you know, we talk a lot about her pro shot chart and, you know, with her size and athleticism, she's so difficult to guard. It's, it, I don't, I think it's underrated until you see her in person. I, you know, I know you mentioned like seeing her uh, because she's, you know, she's just about six foot. She's strong as an ox. You know, she can get to her spots. She can elevate. She's fast. She's got a great first step. Um, so, you know, I think all of that really has helped her again, become a really legit three level scoring threat which translates so much well and with their size to the pro game. It, no doubt in my mind. And I'm very, very eager to see not only what she's added over the summer, like you said, playing for USA basketball, but even mm -hmm. what's here, because there's still, like you said, there's room to grow, which is kind mm -hmm. of amazing Absolutely. and grow what she's already accomplished, you know, and, mm -hmm. and she's also going to be doing it alongside Kitty Henderson, who obviously runs this team and is the engine for mm -hmm. this team. Now, Kitty's entering her junior year. You know, when you look at this offense, when you say, all right, you know, the assists are probably where you'd want them to be. Um, if anything, if there's a, a, any stat area to grow, it's probably on the turnover side of things, right? I think you were 92nd in the country on that side of things. Kitty now being an upperclassman, how critical is her development to doing that? And where are those turnovers? You know, where do you find them and eliminate them when you go back and you look at the film from last year? Yeah, last year was such a unique team because we like would push one through four, one through five sometimes. And yeah. with that, like with our fat, like how fast we were on the court, one through five, I mean, it was special. You know, like we had kids that were running down and backs in nine seconds, right? Uh, so it, I would just say, you know, you have Jada Patrick, Caitlin Davis, Kitty Henderson, Abby Shu all pushing the ball down your throat. And it's that's going to be messy at times, right? Because Caitlin's not a point guard, but like mm -hmm. we gave her that role. Kitty's our point guard, but when you play fast and you play with special athletes, you know, you're going to make aggressive mistakes. And so, you know, when we looked at, we did so many studies, Howard, on turnovers and like how we limit our turnovers. And part of me just started to accept that as long as we can focus on the ones we're going to live with and the ones we're not going to live with, our team is, it's going to be okay. Right. Cause we play such a high possession game that I'm like, you know, we just have to make sure that again, we're not losing points or we're not giving the other team immediate points or opportunities to score. So that live ball turnover was really something we talked about a lot last year, last two years. Um, so that's the one that was like a non-negotiable, right? Uh, but, you know, again, you're going you're gonna to have to eat some of those. And with Kitty specifically, she is, you know, she's so electric. She's just, if you need something to get done, that kid will get it done. And so she's really, what I'm proud of is become more of a student of the game. She's watching a lot more basketball than she ever has. She's in my office talking hoops way more than she ever has. She's a captain this year. So I just think she's really embracing a new level of leadership that is going to take her game to another level. I'm interested. Do you have 
a standard, a stat number you're looking for her to hit, you know, whether it's uh, shooting the ball, whether it's uh, passing the ball. I'm just wondering if there's something that you have in mind where you say, all right, that's that's the number one thing for Titty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's got she's looking to score more. Absolutely. You know, I've been challenging her to get, you know, 12 to 15 points a game um, and to cover that at the point guard spot. And, you know, she's going to play a little bit off the ball this year, too. So we're going to see her, I think you know, in positions to finish plays a little bit more and not just be the person initiating or making that decision. Uh, you know, she's so she's so smart. She's a great screener. She cuts well. She moves without the ball. She understands how to get people open. So we don't want to limit her just to being a, pro, you know, a predominant ball handler all the time. Uh, Makes you sense. Know. Yeah. So I think that's open up the shot chart. No question about it. And, and very interesting to see. And Listen, I think she's not an inner, so it would be fascinating to see. Yeah, so I, even though there's a lot of continuity, there's a lot of new faces that we're going to get into in segment three. You want to talk about that. But first, I want to talk to you about FanDuel, our sponsor today. And it is important, and I need to stress this, that FanDuel has a new offer you probably don't want to take advantage of, but you've got to be careful about who you take advantage of it with. So new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any $5 money line bet. So again, you bet five, you get $150 in bonus bets, but that's only if your team wins. So as a lifelong New York Giants fan, I cannot stress to you enough how dangerous it is to bet on the New York Giants right now, given the way that offense is just simply not performing. But I have looked into it and there are other teams better football teams, teams that actually went on a regular basis. And so you can use them instead. Go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. You can use it on spreads, player props, over under, you name it. The app is just very easy to use. Again, that's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NFL. That's really true. Columbia really needs to come through in women's basketball for all those New York Giants fans who don't really have anything to watch coming up over the next <laughs> couple of years. Why not stress enough? Go go to Columbia instead and go watch a win. There we team. go. We'll welcome it's you. <laughs> so let's talk about the eight newcomers. I have that right, right? Eight newcomers to this team. I mean, you know, Jaden and Caitlin are obviously losses, but there's so much talent there. And I, I guess the place I want to start is the fact that you bring in transfers, you bring in Cecilia Collins from Bucknell, you bring in Ava Ciola from Maryland, two very different programs, but the commonality is coming and playing in the way that you want them to play. What is it that you saw? What links them together and makes them Columbia players in your view? Well, we recruited them both before, right? So this is what you're starting to see is players that, you know, you know, now it's their turn. The transfer portal is what it is these days and making changes for their future and the future that they want. I think relationship wise, we had great relationships with both of them and their families. And, you know, we actually knew Ava quite since she was like in eighth grade because we, we've known her father for a long time, Pennsylvania people. So, sure. and then Cece, I, I had been more of, we knew her and we recruited her, but that was the pandemic was her senior year of high school, right? So difficult time for both of them to be able to navigate that and then go right into college. So, you know, I would say starting with Cece, uh, you know, she, like I remember, so last year we had a lot of common opponents and I remember watching her play Penn Hit a, hit a buzzer beater to go into overtime, then up losing the game. And I was like, if that kid goes in the transfer portal, we are going to get her. <laughs> so <laughs> the minute I saw her name go, I was like all over it. And uh, she's a perfect player because of her IQ, her ability to score at multiple levels in her. I mean, her passing is just elite. It is off the charts. She, she fills the void of Caitlin Davis as, from like a decision maker for us. Mm -hmm. um, but such a unique and different player. Uh, but she's got great size at the guard position. She can play one through four. Um, so, you know, she's going to be a really valuable weapon. And, you know, for, for Ava, Ava is, she's, she's a coach's kid, number one, which as we all know what that means, if you are a coach's kid or you have coached coaches kids, she just gets it, right? She gets, she gets team culture. She gets uh, how to be a good teammate. These are things you don't have to teach her necessarily. Um, and for her, you know, she just wants to be in a system where, you know, she's she's valued, I think, for her intelligent and her IQ. Um, she knows her limitations, but, like, you know, as an athlete, but she also is one of the smartest players I think I'll coach here, you know, right up there with a player like Carly Rivera uh, from last year. So 
you know, for Ava, I'm excited to see her just get acclimate herself a little bit more, get some more time under her belt, um, you know, and she can really shoot the ball too. Great size at six foot. Uh, they both add collective length for us, which which is really helpful with our system. No question about it. And then just this remarkable coincidence, right? You have a Kitty Henderson on the roster. You also have somebody named Fliss Henderson on the roster uh, from yeah. the same uh, town in Australia. I assume no relation, right? None. Nope. I have no. They just kind of look alike too. It's about the same height. Yeah. <laughs> I, I it, does that make it easier, you know, to coach siblings to come in and have an understanding of the system? You know, just take me through what even that recruiting is, is like when somebody's already playing for you. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because so when I went to Australia in 2017 and I started developing relationships, yeah. I we obviously were recruiting Kitty at that time, and I knew about her younger sister. They also have an older sister who did not come to the states, and. Mm -hmm. You know, I when I saw her younger, I saw film of the of Felicity Fliss, and I was like, she is really good. Like I was like, who is that kid? You know, uh, and what I loved about Kitty, it, there were similarities, but they're extremely different players. And mm -hmm. you know, Fliss, much like Kitty, both went through a time where they did not want to come to the states, and that's you know, you, you we respected that, but because she was Kitty's sister, it was the relationship was already there, right? I've known her since she was you know 15, 14 years old, and mm -hmm. um, so then when the time came around for her to want to come, I remember Kitty saying like, coach, I think she's like serious about it now. And she was like, if she comes, she only wants to come and play here. And I said, okay. Uh, so, you know, we started going down that path again and, you know, we just had to get to the point where our relationship was established and we almost started like re-recruiting her again because we took this time away from it. So, but I can tell you like Howard, she is, so fun to watch. Uh, I mean, she is definitely going to make her mark and, you know, have her own name here and not just be Kitty's sister. I can tell you that. It is very exciting and just so many players to get to. And, uh, you know, we, we always have more to talk about than we have time to go, but I want to finish on a number that feels to me like a magic trick. And I want you to just explain to me how you do it. You are top 15 in the country last year in three-point attempts. You're doing it at an elevated rate. You're also top 15 in the country in offensive rebounding rate and percentage. This is normally the trade-off. Mm -hmm. How is it you do this and what is it that allows your team to run through walls for you like that? Because across the board, you guys rebound so well. But that particular, like, I, I mean, are you particularly proud of being able to pair those two things? Most definitely. It's and it's part of our philosophy, right? We, you know, I guess that when I got this job, you know, seven years ago, we this was how we always wanted to play. We just didn't have the the personnel to do it. And so, you know, fast forward, you know, you bring in a class of Abby Shu, Caitlin Davis, Carly Rivera, and our on our system completely changed, you know, within the class ahead of them was Sienna Durr, Hannah Pratt, Lillian right. Kennedy, Madison Hardy, right? So you're, you know, you have this this amazing group of, of players in front of them and they, their personalities and, and styles just merged so well that we could shift finally. Uh, and then once we, they started really understanding, you know, why these things were valuable and teaching them about shot selection and also the value of the second chance and how that allows us to, you know, tag up and make sure mm -hmm. we're matched up. And then our transition defense numbers are also really good because we're so versatile that, you know, our five can pick up the point guard if they need to, you know, for the length of the court and then make that switch in the back end. Um, and honestly, communication, like us really harping on communication, being great communicators has allowed all of it to tie nicely together because you can't do, you can't play this way unless your team understands the domino effect that they create with, within the team when they do something. So yeah, no, it's those two things that we're extremely proud of. Those are things that we harp on all the time. We think that they're total like game changers. Um, you know, and they're really hard to play against. <laughs> they are really hard to play against. And uh, bad news for your opponents. I expect <laughs> they'll be playing against it uh, through uh, a lot of March, not just the regular season as well. So, uh, Megan Griffith, I appreciate you always. Uh, make sure, listeners, if you are anywhere in the vicinity of a Columbia game, you go see this team play. It is such fun. Uh, thank you for listening. As always, we will be back with you tomorrow. The great Natalie Heffern is hosting. T. Baker 
this year. Uh, they were on hand for Big East Media Day, and we'll be talking all about not just Seton Hall, an opponent that Columbia uh, has on the schedule again this year, but throughout up and down the Big East Conference, uh, which is like the uh, the the poor person's Ivy League. Is that what you <laughs> Yeah, exactly. That's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so until then, I'm host Howard Meddahl, wishing all of you a wonderful Thursday. Welcome to Wallet. You are Locked On Women's Basketball, your daily podcast on women's basketball.